All right, so here we are, last chapter, chapter 17, which is called The Hunting of the White Stag. So if we were to go back and review chapter 16, which was called What Happened About the Statues, we know that um, Aslan, Lucy, and Susan went to the White Witch's castle, and the girls noticed that Aslan was breathing on the statues, and <clears throat> when he was doing that, he was using magic in order to bring um, the statues back to life. Those statues then would become part of the army that would go back um, near the stone table where the battlefield was and um, help to defeat the White Witch and her army. When they did get back there, they noticed that um, Peter was using the sword from Father Christmas and was um, trying to defeat the White Witch. Ultimately, Aslan stepped in and the White Witch met her demise. Okay. So that leads us to chapter 17. So this is going to give us that huge piece of the resolution, that element of plot, um, the final one of the story. All right. The battle was all over a few minutes after their arrival. Most of the enemy had been killed in the first charge of Aslan and his companions. And when those who were still living saw that the witch was dead, they either gave themselves up or took to flight. The next thing that Lucy knew was that Peter and Aslan were shaking hands. It was, it was strange to see Peter looking as he looked now. His face was so pale and stern, and he seemed so much older. It was all Edmund's doing, Aslan, Peter was saying. We'd have been beaten if, he, if, he hadn't been, if it hadn't been for him. The witch was turning our troops into stone left and right, but nothing would stop him. He fought his way through three ogres to where she was turning one of your leopards into a statue and then he reached her and had sense to bring his sword smashing down on her wand instead of trying to go for her directly and simply getting made a statue himself for his pains that was the mistake all the rest were making once her wand was broken we began to have some chance if we hadn't lost so many already he was terribly wounded we must go and see him they found edmund in charge of Mr. Mrs. Beaver, a little way back from the fighting line. He was covered with blood, his mouth was open, and his face a nasty green color. Quick, Lucy, said Aslan. And then, almost for the first time, Lucy remembered the precious cordial that had been given to her for a Christmas present. Her hands trembled so much that she could hardly undo the stopper, but she managed it in the end and poured a few drops into her brother's mouth. There are other people wounded, said Aslan, while she was still looking eagerly into Edmund's pale face and wondering if the cordial would have any result. I know, said Lucy cross crossly. Wait a minute. Daughter of Eve, said Aslan in a greater voice. Others are also at the point of death. Must more people die for Edmund? I'm sorry, Aslan, said Lucy, getting up and going along with him. And for the next half hour, they were busy. She attending to the wounded while he restored those who had been turned into stone. When at last she was free to come back to Edmund, she found him standing on his feet and not only healed of his wounds, but looking better than she had seen him look. Oh, for ages. In fact, ever since his first term at that horrid school, which was where he had begun to go wrong, he had become his real old self again and could look you in the face. And there on the field of battle, Aslan made him a knight. Does he know, whispered Lucy to Susan, what Aslan did for him? Does he know what the arrangement with the, writ, with the witch really was? Hush, no, of course not, said Susan. Oughtn't he be told, said Lucy? Oh, surely not, said Susan. It would be too awful for him. Think how you'd feel if you were he. All the same, I think he ought to know, said Lucy. But at that moment, they were interrupted. That night they slept where they were. How Aslan provided food for them all, I don't know. But somehow or other, they found themselves all sitting down on the grass to a fine high tea at about eight o'clock. Next day, they began marching eastward down the side of the great river. And the next day after that, at about tea time, they actually reached the mouth. The castle of Care Paravel on its little hill towered up above them. Before them were the sands with rocks and little pools of salt water and seaweed and the smell of the sea and miles and long miles of bluish green waves breaking forever and ever on the beach and oh the cry of the seagulls have you heard it can you remember that evening after tea the four children all managed to get down to the beach again and get their shoes and stockings off and feel the sand between their toes but next day was more solemn for then in the great hall of care paravel that wonderful hall with the ivory roof and the west wall 
hung with peacock feathers an eastern door, which looked towards the sea in the presence of all their friends and the sound of the trumpets. Aslan solemnly crowned them and led them to the four thrones amid deafening shouts of long live King Peter, long live Queen Susan, long live King Edmund, and long live Queen Lucy. Once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen. Bear it well, son of Adam, bear it well, daughters of Eve, said Aslan. And through the eastern door, which was wide open, came the voices of the merman and the mermaids swimming close to the shore and singing in honor of their new kings, kings and queens. So the children sat in their thrones and scepters were put out in their hands and they gave rewards and honors to all of their friends, to Tumnus the fawn and to the beavers and giant rumble buffin, to the leopards and the good centaurs and the good dwarfs and the lion. And that night there was a great feast in Care Paravel, and revelry and dancing, and gold flashed and wine flowed, and answering the music and inside, but stranger, sweeter, and more piercing came the music of the sea people. But amidst all of these rejoicings, Aslan himself quietly slipped away, and when the kings and queens noticed that he wasn't there, they said nothing about it, for Mr. Beaver had warned them. He'll be coming and going, he had said. One day you'll see him, and another you won't. He doesn't like being tied down, and of course, he has other countries to attend to. It's quite all right. He'll often drop in, only you mustn't press him. He's wild, you know, not like a tame lion. And now, as you see, the story is nearly, but not quite, at an end. These two kings and queens governed Narnia well, and long and happy was their reign. At first, much of their time was spent seeking out the remnants of the White Witch's army and destroying them, and indeed for a long time there would be news of evil things lurking in the wilder parts of the forest, a haunting here and a killing there, and a glimpse of a werewolf one month and a rumor of a hag the next, but in the end all that foul brood was stamped out, and they made good laws and kept the peace and saved good trees from being un unnecessarily cut down and liberated young dwarfs and young satyrs from being sent to school and generally stopped busybodies and interferers and encouraged ordinary people who wanted to live and let live. And they drove back to the fierce giants, quite a different sort from giant Rumblebuffin on the north of Narnia where these vent when these ventured across the frontier. And they entered into friendship and alliance with countries beyond the sea and paid them visits of state and received visits of state from them. And they themselves grew and changed as the years passed over them. And Peter became a tall and deep chested man and a great warrior and was called King Peter the Magnificent. And Susan grew into a tall and gracious woman with black hair that fell almost to her feet. And the kings of the countries beyond the sea began to send ambassadors asking for her hand in marriage. And she was called Susan the Gentle. Edmund was a graver and quieter man than Peter, and great in counsel and judgment. He was called King Edmund the Just. But as for Lucy, she was always, uh, always gay and golden-haired, and all princes in those parts desired her to be their queen, and her own people called her Queen Lucy the Valiant. So they lived in great joy, and if ever they remembered their life in this world, it was only as one remembers a dream. And one year it fell out that Tumnus, who was a middle-aged fawn by now and beginning to be stout, came down the river and brought them the news that the white stag had once more appeared in his parts. The white stag who would give you wishes if you caught him. So remember, we, that was at the beginning of the novel they talked about that. So these two kings and two queens with the principal members of their court rode a hunting with horns and hounds in the western woods to follow the white stag. And they had not hunted long before they had sight of him. And he led them a great pace over the rough and smooth and through thick and thin till the horses of all the courtiers were tired out and these four were still following. And they saw the stag enter into a thicket where their horses could not follow. Then said King Peter, for they talked in a quite different style now, having been kings and queens for so long. Fair consorts, let us now alight from our horses and follow the beast into the thicket. For in all my days, I've never hunted a nobler quarry. Sir, said the others, even so let us do. So they alighted and tied their horses to trees and went into the thick wood on foot. And as soon as they had entered it, Queen Susan said, Fair friends, here is a great marvel, for I seem to see a tree of iron. Madam, said King Edmund, if you look well upon it, you shall see it as a pillar of iron from a lantern set on top thereof. By the lion's mane, a strange device, said King Peter, to set a lantern here with the trees clustered so thick about it and so high above it, that if it were lit, it should give light to no man. Sir, said Queen Lucy, by likelihood, when this post and this 
lamp were set here, there were smaller trees in place, or fewer or none. For this is a young wood, and the iron post is old, and they stood looking upon it. Then said King Edmund, I know not how it is, but this lamp on this post worketh upon me strangely. It runs in my mind that I have seen the like before, as if it were in a dream, or a dream of a dream. Sir, answered they all, it is even so with us. And more, said Queen Lucy, for it will not go out of my mind that if we pass this post and lantern, either we shall find strange adventures or else some great change of our fortune. Madam, said King Edmund, the like foreboding stirreth in my heart also. And mine, fair brother, said King Peter, and in mine too, said Queen Susan, whereof by my counsel we shall lightly return to our horses and follow this white stag no further. Madam, said King Peter, therein I pray thee to have me excused, for never since we four were kings and queens in Narnia have we set our hands to any high matter as battles, quests, feasts of arms, acts of justice, and the like, and then given them over. But always what we have taken in hand, the same we have achieved. Sister, said Queen Lucy, my royal brother speaks rightly, and it seems to me that we should be shamed if for any fearing or foreboding we turn back from following so noble a beast as now we have in chase. And so say I, said King Edmund, and I have such desire to find the signification of that thing that I would not by goodwill turn back for the richest jewel in Narnia and all of the islands. Then in the name of Aslan, said Queen Susan, if ye will all have it so, let us go and take adventure, take the adventure that shall fall to us. So these kings and queens entered the thicket, and before they had gone a score of paces, they all remembered that the thing they had seen was called a lamp post. And before they had gone twenty more, they noticed that they were making their way not through branches but through coats. And the next moment they all came tumbling out of a wardrobe door and into an empty room. And they were no longer kings and queens in their hunting array, but just Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy in their old clothes. It was the same day and the same hour of the day on which they had all gone into the wardrobe to hide. Mrs. McCready and the visitors were still talking in the passage, but luckily they never came into the empty room and so the children weren't caught. And that would have been the very end of the story if it hadn't been that they felt they really must explain to the professor why four of the coats out of his wardrobe were missing. And the professor, who was a very remarkable man, didn't tell them not to be silly or not to tell lies, but believing the whole story. No, he said, I don't think it will be any good trying to go back through the wardrobe door to get the coats. You won't get into Narnia again by that route, nor will the coats be much use by now if you did. Eh, what's that? Yes, of course you'll get back to Narnia again some day. Once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. But don't go trying to use the same route twice. Indeed, don't try to get there all, uh, get there at all. It'll happen when you're not looking for it. And don't talk too much about it, even among yourselves. And don't mention it to anyone else unless you find that they've had adventures of the same sort themselves. What's that? How will you know? Oh, you'll know all right. Odd things they say, even their looks. We'll let the secret out. Keep your eyes open. Bless me. What do they teach them in these schools? These what do they teach them at these schools? And that is the very end of the adventure in the wardrobe. But if the professor was right, it's only the beginning of the adventures in Narnia. All right, so we are able to uh, identify our resolution of the story here. Um, if you did like this book, um, or you know the concept of this book, um, the genre, there are several books in this series. Um, so you can look them up and maybe get them in for some summer reading. All right, guys. Miss ya.